interesting it uh, to record. All right, good. Um, so a second, chuck, chuck. All right, so welcome uh, to this, uh, to the Rebase conference. Rebase is, a, um, is an event that we try to hold twice a year. Uh, last time, for reasons outside of our control, it happened only once and was collocated with the Splash Conference in virtual Chicago. And uh, this time we're uh, with ECOOP in virtual Aarhus. You can feel the Danish, uh, there's a Danish feeling on this meeting. Uh, and our next instance will be in physical Chicago with Splash in uh, the fall. So we hope that this actually works out. Um, all right, so it's a pleasure to introduce, uh, well, maybe let me just tell you about the format. First, the format of, of the, 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 the slot is we have about one hour 50 and we will uh, spend that time with first a talk by Cliff and then um, I will let Chris uh, give uh, you know, position statement, uh, re response, or speak for a few words about what, what he's working on. And then we will have a larger discussion with everyone involved. Um, in terms of uh, questions, put them in the chat. I will read them to, to Cliff. Um, and, or I will leave them to the discussion if they're more, sort of, you know, of more general nature. Um, all right, so it's a pleasure to introduce our two participants, speakers. Um, I'll start uh, with Cliff. So Cliff Click is a hero of mine. His work at, on Hotspot, the Java VM, uh, affected my, my research. We built on the system he built and used it. Then he went to Azul and built a massively parallel Java box with hardware transactional memory. And my university, I was like the first academic customer of Azul. Then I had the luck to spend a sabbatical with him when he created the H2O open source distributed machine learning platform. Um, little known fact, H2O was written in Java, but I don't think Cliff had written much Java before because his Java looked like C++. Um, and then uh, Chris Latner. So I've never met Chris in person, but followed his work from his day, from the days it was a PhD topic somewhere in the Midwest, where I was also living, and watched with amazement the success of LLVM. Again, it's a system that I use and that I use for my research, like many others, uh, like many other people out there. And the other project, project that is near and dear to my heart is the Swift language. And if you haven't tried the latest version, you should go now or after the talk, go, go and download it. All right, enough uh, advertisements. Let's have uh, Cliff take the floor. Cliff. Cliff? Did we lose Cliff? And, um... If you're muted. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mute, Sorry. how about now? How about now? Yeah. Is that better? That is better. Okay. So who am I? Um, uh, I've been, uh, uh, I'm sorry. You can press play on your slides. Is it not? Me. Oh, just hit the, yes. Uh, yeah, whatever. I don't even know how to do it now. Do you just go take forever? Show, I think slideshow, slideshow, the, the S. How about that? Okay. Perfect. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm here to, well, oh, I see, and I have to appear forward and backward. Well, so who am I? Let me do that first. So I've been writing compilers since, you know, I was 15. So I was 45 years writing compilers, um, distributed systems, computation, a lot of HPC, OS work, hotspot, low latency GCs, uh, as Jan mentioned, custom Java hardware, concurrent algorithms, non-blocking algorithms, a lot of ML, a lot of distributed computations. 20 more patents, dozens of papers, hundreds of public talks. Um, I've been around a while. And so I, I'm doing a new language. And, and you know, the question immediately comes up is why? Um, and that's because, well, because I can, because it's fun, because I'm a tool builder, because I want to help people that do systems coding and HPC coding and then mobile and concurrent distributed and cloud things. And in all of these kinds of programming environments, I found that the language is available to me at the time 
um, missed out on some key pieces of support that should be easy to add and baked into the language of the compiler or the typing system somehow. And I had to hand do lots of things that I thought could have been, could have, would have, should have been done elsewhere and or use like boilerplate that had to be carefully cut and pasted everywhere, the same identical in order to make it work right. And I, why couldn't I make this happen some other way or have support for the language? So I'm doing the language because there's a bunch of things I want to see that never showed up all in the same language, even today. Um, when is it ready? Well, not yet. So, you know, do no advertising before you're ready. Here I am advertising and I'm not ready. Uh, I don't have an execution engine. I can type, um, I can parse, I can't execute anything. So, you know, buyer beware. Um, it's been active development for the last three years. I'm still going strong. Um, there's a link to the readme on GitHub. It's open source. Um, design goal. So it's a new language. You have a design goal, right? So ease of use and understanding concise, fast, rebel, said every language design doc ever. I've read 30, 40 design docs. Um, first class functions with side effects, uh, you know, real closures, strong static typing with full type inference, you know, optional type annotations, but you don't have to. For instance, nullable types like Kotlin style can come out of this. Um, fast with a well-specified cost model, so you don't get surprises on performance. So basically all the syntactic sugar optimizes away if you ask for it. If you want syntactic sugar, you do, and it's easy and you love it and it makes your life easier. And sometimes you wanna go fast and you're gonna eat a terabyte log file and the, and the syntactic sugar gets in your way. And then it can't be too weird because all new languages have a weirdness budget for their programmers. So you have to be able to look at it and kind of figure out what it's doing. So think C minus minus without keywords, so really minimal syntax. Um, a very small number of core language features. So says everybody else as well. Um, everything's an expression. Uh, most everything's a function call and can be overloaded, except there's a bunch of hard inline guarantees. So a fixed cost model for certain things. So you can have a matrix plus matrix operator. Um, and integer add is a function, but three plus five will be inline. I hard guarantee it. And you'll get what you expect out of that, which is probably folded to an eight. Um, so no keywords, as I mentioned, I'm not certain that I love that or I hate it, but it makes for an interesting looking language. Modules, for instance, are just probably going to be a struct, no special syntax. Loops at the moment are just a function, no special syntax. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. So let's get into basics. Basics are things that kind of look like C um, or Java. There's a variable assignment that says something can be changed, X can be changed. Uh, there's final assignments. Um, after a final assignment, no load sees any other value. But if your variable assigned, you can be reassigned until you're finally assigned. So you can, for instance, build cyclic structures that are final. Um, expressions have normal operator precedence. You get the auto widening from insta floats. You get a normal call syntax. Math is a module that's also a user struct that just grabs a field called squirt, which has a function call, which does what you expect. You can unpack for your tuples. You can assign or declare variables in the middle of expressions. They're immediately usable thereafter. So here I have delta x is x1 minus x0 times delta x. Same for delta y. So I get a dx squared plus dy squared square root of and sort of a, a simple, easy to write syntax. Um, I don't have if then else's per se. I have trinary expressions. Um, any non nil value is truthy and nil is falsy and, and not the JavaScript. So empty strings are not nil, so they're truthy. Um, variables can be declared on different arms uh, of an if, and as long as you have a dominating set of assignments, they're usable afterwards. So sys.p is sys.print, if you will, system dot out dot print line. Standard short circuit operators, um, they're also function calls. They just funk their right-hand side arguments and pass them in, so you can overload these as well. Um, they do what you expect. So maybe a little less obvious, the temp equal expert is nil checked. If it's not nil, I promptly use it. So I assign a new temp and I use it after it's been nil checked. Um, conditionals have a default to zero on the colon zero. So you can just use the question mark to cascade a bunch of nil checks in a row. And the end result is nil or the value of pointer one arrow, pointer two arrow value. Structures, um, they're all anonymous. I'll get to the name structure types in a minute. Um, here's a name point. It has a name field, finally assigned cliff. It has an X and Y that are given default types by the type referencing. Um, normal field access rules. Uh, nil checks are enforced by the compiler. So you, if you can't, the compiler can't determine that you won't be a nil, you have to put a nil test in and handle it somehow. Here I did a endpoint.x equals endpoint.y equals three. I just do a final assignment to the point values since they were immutably assigned before. Tuples are basically structures with no names. You can just collect things together in a tuple and access them with dot one, dot two, dot three for the field offsets, if you will. Um, structures are 
two bowls, so you can same thing there. Arrays, they're going to be range checked because my experience with Java told me that I could get the cost of range checks down to tolerably low. Um, and then you get a huge amount of security for that. Um, so here's an array of 100, it's untyped default storage size or an array with a storage size, you know, it's bytes. Um, if you want an aligned array, you're probably not gonna have a special language syntax for that. You'll have to make a call to go get such a thing. Read, write, and length fields uh, calls look pretty normal except for length, which is a prefix function call to get an array length. Um, reads will widen from the storage class to either int or float, or if you're a reference type, you just, you know, you get a pointer loaded. And writes will narrow with the sort of obvious normal narrowing rules. I don't have a final write syntax, but I intend to. What that would mean if I was to write an array that I wanted the elements to be constant when you're done. That's a thing that Java lacks that I really want to have. I don't have the syntax figured out yet. All of these array operators are actually just function calls that with a hard inline guarantee, uh, but you can overload them. So you can do the same thing for any kind of collection, like a dictionary with a hash table or whatever, use the same syntax. Functions, uh, functions are all anonymous. They all do the obvious lexical scope introduction. Um, there's an open curly to start a function. There's a list of parameters, an arrow and a body. The last body is your return result. There's a short exit return I'm not showing here. You can type the arguments. Um, you can assign them to a variable that's a common obvious way to go make a classical C function I would say distance is equal to. That's just a normal variable it happens to be finally assigned to a function. You can make a function call as a normal C style. You can make function calls as sort of a functional call style. If they have one argument, you just pass the argument as the last argument. Um, if you have no arguments to your function, you could skip the arrow, which means you can thunk code by just putting curlies around it. Uh, and then all the classic operators like add, subtract, multiply, divide are just normal functions that are being called infix style. They have a little funny syntax if you want to bring them out as a function to pass them along, where the underbar shows you how the, the infix, prefix, postfix goes. Functions can be defined recursively, pretty normally. Um, functions can capture and side effect external variables. So here I have a global count set to zero. I have an increment function that's just going to do plus plus, and I can call it do the obvious thing. The bigger example here, I have a make counter, which has a hidden internal state for the closure that requires, and then the closure has upward exposed variables. So it has to be allocated. You're making a counter every time you call make count. You get a pair of functions out. One gives you the counter value, one increments the counter. So I call it twice here. I get a counter for A, a counter for B. I can increment them independently. I can verify their independent counts. This stuff all works right now. Loops. Um, loops are just user variables that have assigned a funny function, which is in the middle, which if you're a C programmer, probably looks like cat-like typing. And if you're a functional programmer, if you study it, it makes sense in the end. But let's look how it's used. So while it takes a predicate function and a body function, and the body is executed for side effects, and the predicate returns true or false to exit the loop. So I make an array of 100. I have an index variable. Let's say i++ plus less than length of the array. Um, that loops over the array. And then I do an array assignment to fill the array with squares. And I return you the array of 100 elements filled with their squares. Sort of pretty straightforward syntax I'm hoping. Here's a for loop. It's the same as a while loop, except the body's result is tested for true is another exit condition. Um, so again, uh, you know, here's a big example. Find as a, I'm implementing a find call to find an element in an array and it returns me the index or minus one. And I have an index variable i and I say for i plus plus less than length of the array. Uh, if I find it with a question mark, then I exit the loop with i plus one because zero is not an is not a, is a false, not a true value. I have to have a true key value, um, which means my index is off by one. It's too high, so subtract one. And and in fact, the for loop is just a set of function calls made one after another and has a value. And I don't need the index equals temporary, so I can get rid of it and just subtract one from the execution of the for loop. And that's my re that's my final expression. That's my return value. So that's sort of what loops look like. Um, I'm not sure I like this, so consider this a work in progress. In particular, I, as a induction variable for, for the array, has to be declared outside both of the a, a predicate and the function body, the body functions, so that it's available in scope for them both. Um, this is what how old school C did for many years, and they finally said, no, for loop introduces a new scope. And therefore, you can tuck the induction variable inside the scope and exit when, when the for loop ends, the i, you know, i equals zero, i plus plus thing, that disappears out of your scope. So I'm not sure I like this yet because the scope's wrong for the index variable, but it doesn't require me to add any syntax to the language, which I kind of like. Work in progress, see how it goes. 
type annotations. I've been putting type annotations in the comments. You can put them anywhere in the code. You can put them on you know, variables. You can put them on expressions, put them in arguments to functions. The, the twice call in the middle, I put them pretty much everywhere, um, kind of overkill. In, in large complex functional programs where you do a lot of type inferencing is my experience, a lot of people's experience that you need the annotations to help you understand the program. And so skipping too many annotations uh, makes your program hard to read. And if you get an error, the error messages aren't necessarily the best. Now I'll claim, I'll get to that in a minute. I claim I have a way to get some really good error messages out. Still annotations are, are a useful way to tell you what's going on in the program. So put them where you want them. Um, very, uh, types can be named. Um, and this is a, a, an assignment operator, but the colon follows the assignment. So colon starts all types. So you're assigning a type to meters or yards. And then you get the obvious you know, nominative testing here. And so you can't confuse meters and yards here by accident. You can name structures types the same kind of way. Uh, here I declare a point to as a two dimensional point. It's a structure with a, a, an X and a Y um, that are finally assigned to float types, which means they have to be assigned in the constructor. Um, with the type annotation, I get a constructor of the same name, which takes uh, you know, a list of arguments. It takes a couple of a couple, a couple overloaded constructor variants by default, and then you can ask for constructors. Um, having a named type, I can now use it everywhere I can use a type annotation. So I can make a distance call that takes a point to, uh, and then does the obvious distancey thing with it. I can subtype by saying, uh, you know, point three is a type, which is assigned to point two, extended with a Z as a float. And then I have, you know, a point three constructor and I can make a point three thing. I can pass it to a point two because it subtypes, it has the right structure. But it does point two math in the dist call because the dist call takes a point two and, you know, does the obvious thing here. So no surprises other than maybe the syntax is a little tighter than what you're used to. I have both nominative and structural typing implemented here. Uh, structural means you have the right structure and nominative means you have to be called the right name. Yeah. There's a couple of questions before you go too far. Let me ask them. So oh, they all popped up at Marco, once. Marco was asking, uh, is A structural or nominally typed? Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Uh -huh. It's both. And I'm, this is the slide where I explain the difference. Okay, so, oh yeah, actually I didn't see that. I was reading the question. Uh, and then there's two more that I just wanted to uh, throw yeah. at you. Um, yes. David is unsure about four. What about yes. implementing for each map and flat map and use those instead of four as often as possible? Right. So, so I wanted the. So let me back up here. So I want the 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 standard for loop to be available, and I had to be able to write. It. I wanted to be able to write it in the language. Okay. Having been able to write a for loop that's kind of reasonable, like I said, I don't like necessarily the the scope for the index variable issue, but I, otherwise I've written a for loop here. Now, can I write some other kind of loops? Certainly. Um, and exactly, I'll talk about this somewhat later. Like, I want to have parallelizing loops or loops that give me uh, loop comprehension, um, which is entirely doable. And I should be able to write them straight up in the language. And some of these will be provided for you by default, like for and while. I won't ask you to write them every time. You'll just get them as part of the, the top level prelude inclusion, if you will, on the on the bare language. There'll be, there'll be a, you know, an initial set of includes like sys will get included and, and for and while and things like that will show up. Yeah. Um, okay. So Dimitri asks about overloading of, upper, uh, of arithmetic operators. Can yeah, so let me cover that coming up because I have a, okay, I have a more complicated overloading. Yeah, yeah the answer is yes, but there's a, there's, a, there's a twist to make okay. sure it's obvious what it is. Then so Chris there asks too. a question about point two B point three. Are they yes. passed by value or by reference? Does this get a copy slice of point three C plus plus style? Yes. Can it mutate point three? Yeah. So um, you get a. This is by reference. Um, I, I, I've gone back and forth on by value versus by reference, and I'm not sure I like it because of the mysterious cost model. So I want to have an obvious cost model, and maybe there's a way to make value types have a reasonable cost, but I don't have it yet in my head. So this is by reference. Dist two is declared to take a, a point two. He's allowed to do point two, where to go? He's allowed to do point two things. I, I, I went too fast here. Where did my point to go? Yeah. Um, he's allowed to do point two things to the things he gets, which means he can't touch point three fields, but he can touch yeah. point two field, the prefix of point three. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. But I think it also it comes back to the mutability model as well. And so yeah, it, it does. 
bottom which part. I haven't gone big time down. Go ahead. And, ask and think, so, 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 I mean, it's just part of the just general mental model of how, how a programmer would think yeah. about it, right? And it's it's not just the typing rules, but it's also the semantics. I think that right. are really aspect of this. So yeah. if if the point in fields are immutable, they've been assigned, finally assigned, this can't change them. As if the point two fields are available as read only because the guy who's handing it to point says, my, this is a point two where I declare read only. I didn't talk about read only fields. I have those as well. Mm -hmm. I can make a, 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 a can cast point two to a read only that is simply a type change and then hand it off to disk. And disk gets a point two that's read only. Cool. So disk can declare he's a read only guy and I can demand I only call read only things. I can hand you a read only guy and, and then I'll give you a type error if you hand me a readable guy. If you try to hand off a readable, a writable guy, that get the do, correct. Do you support separate compilation, or are yes. you assuming that all source code can be seen? No, no, it's going to be separate, except that the type checking when you do the link step might get complicated. And as soon as you get that, then the question of whether you actually generate code at link time or at separate compilation earlier time is sort of moot. It can go both ways with fairly similar costs. Um, I, currently, my theory is I'm going to really support separate compilation. But the link step has to do all the typing uh, that's required. The type's non-trivial, but I can make it fast. And, and I think, you know, knock on plastic close to linear time, but the linker will have to do the, the proper typing checks. Before we go on, one last quick question. Are you handling SIMD operation, Alan asks. Yeah, exactly. So I don't have an execution engine. That's performance. OK. So I, I, I suggest we let Cliff continue. Otherwise, we'll de you know, derail the yeah, talk right. too much. You, yeah. never getting, it's, it's all good. Yeah, it's all fun. Um, yeah. So I was down to structural versus nominative typing. Um, and the answer is both. If you use a name, you got to be nominative. So in the middle, I have dist zero and dist one called either with a structure of the correct structure or with a point two, which has the correct structure. Dist zero takes any one with an X and Y. And in fact, that would be a, that's the inferred type for P there. I wouldn't have to actually put that type annotation on. I get it's the same thing whether I put it on or don't. Whereas dist one requires a point two and you get a typing error if you pass it a correct structure, but it's not called point two. So both nominative and structural. The bottom section of the slide is new. This is a linked list. It is a type assignment that is recursive. Um, it has a next field, which is a variant. It has a question mark, which means it's nillable. Otherwise, it's not nillable by default. Value is declared to be uh, mutable of anything. So it's like a linked list of object. There's type parameters. So I don't like that syntax, but there I can make a linked list containing strings only, for instance, or a hash table of strings to person objects or whatever, right? It's, it's, it's type variables are in there. They come out of the Hindley Milner style typing setup I've got going. I don't like the syntax for declaring types yet. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm open to suggestions. In Java, you would use angle brackets. I really don't like those, but maybe. Um, method calls. Method calls are just functions. Um, so structs can have fields to hold functions. So here's a point two. It's a structure definition. It has an X and Y field, has a dist field. Dist field is a final constant field. The constant happens to be a function. Because it's a final constant, I'm going to move it out of the object into some sort of shared space, B table, if you will, for a point two. So it doesn't take any space in the point two object, but it will be available as a normal field. Um, and then it happens to be assigned a function. This function has a dot for a parameter. That's a this pointer default argument that just injects the namespace inside the, the function. So when I use it, I would take a point to object. I do disk, that's a field lookup. I get the field out, happens to be a function. I do curl a open parens, that's a function call. I call this too. The only special syntax here is because it's a uh, this pointer style call, I'll take that point to and pass it as the first argument to the function. Otherwise, you know, methods are actually just normal user fields holding final constant values. Any final constant value can be moved out of the object and into some sort of shared space that's the same for all objects, not just functions, but that would be the obvious case. Subclassing works pretty much how you expect it. Um, here's a point three, same as a point two, it adds an extra field, it adds an extra dist. Um, but wait, I'm finally assigning dist twice here. Um, what's that mean? Well, so what happens here is that I can always overwrite functions, final, finally assigned functions, as long as there's no ambiguous overload. I have to tell from every context exactly which function I'm calling, or I have to tell with the one-shot virtual dispatch, a single inheritance dispatch style. 
So in this case, dist is an overload. Um, I do the normal thing you would expect out of an overloaded function call. I load up the point, I load the dist field that requires me to go to the V table because it's not unique for all point twos. It's variant from point twos and their subclasses. And then I load that field out and call it. So it does a standard load, load, jump register for a virtual call as a cost model. Now what the compiler does under the hood, whether inlining happens, whether inline caching happens, bunch of optimizations apply, the normal cost models, that's a B call. Um, I have to have some kind of way to do testing for types. So some sort of reified types. I don't like my current syntax. It's a work in progress because point three needs to be a type. And currently that's the same syntax I would use for a constructor for point three, which is a function, not a type. So point less than equal to something that says it's a point three type wants to happen here. I don't know what that syntax will look like. Certainly after that test though, your uh, point can be inflated or, or upcast to a point three. And I can use it as a point three like context afterwards. Same as you know, you do nillables for Kotlin or any other bunch of languages do this kind of thing. You just upcast uh, after the question mark, and and you got the the, the better answer on the other side. Um, this is a fun one. So as part and partial of my fun typing games, I live in a land where error types are just part of the normal typing game. They don't cause a failure to any of my algorithms. So my typer can always tell if a predicate's going to be at typing time, true or false. And if it's known to be constant value, true or false, then the dead arm has to parse, but doesn't have to type. So string binary or you know, bitwise and four is not well typed. And you would get a typing error in nearly every language that I know of. And I can take that and say, no, I don't care because you're in a dead arm because I know true is true. So this can be used specifically to cover the if def case. I'm, I'm targeting the if def case for the, the C systems programming guys, where I might say, I have a bunch of OSs I'm supporting, only one's turned on at a time. In the other arms, the variables may be undefined. They may be incorrect argument counts. They might have the wrong types, um, but I don't care. On the platform of choice, I'll get the well-typed argument that I want. On the other platforms, the code will parse, but it won't type and I don't care that it doesn't type. So that's maybe a little unusual. And that's, again, well tested, uh, at least the typing time. OK, so that's sort of the, a, a very high level quick run through. Yeah, who's the target audience? Well, it's me, of course. <laughs> but I want to support writing OS-like things. And I want to support writing high performance-like things. And I want to support you know too much stuff, right? So all the different things I've done in my life, which is like almost every kind of programming style floating around. Um, and, and I'm looking to help all kinds of folks. So whether or not I hit the mark is, you know, open question. So, so the obvious one is you, you, you try too hard is please too many people and you please nobody. That's the obvious fail. Um, you know, I'm not there yet. So, so maybe I get there, maybe I don't, maybe I end up focusing in on one particular audience in the end. But right now I'm kind of keeping my goals wide and my targets wide. Okay, so state of the implementation, um, like I said, you know, the things you saw there are pretty much all type check and parse, except for a few of the work in progress ones. I have a couple hundred test cases doing the right things. No execution engine, so you can't actually run any code. Um, so that's why I'm saying this talks too soon, but you know, Jan turned me, to, convinced me to do it anyhow. I did a major effort in the last six months combining Henry Milner and sort of classic forward flow typing or C or Java style typing. Um, I have a lot of decisions I've made, a lot of decisions uh, that are made or not implemented. I have a lot of things to open questions that I'm coming up onto here. So this is really a talk about designing a language and, and what design decisions do you do? So first, we talk one little bit about what I've done here. So I took two well-known, well-loved typing systems, Henley Milner style and sort of classic flow typing, um, and I've combined them in, in a good way. So full type inference, annotations are never required. Maybe I'll encourage them, but they're not required. And I think I can do this in, in time that's no worse than the standard Henley Milner time with reasonable constant factors. In the Milner, I've done the usual good extensions. So records, structs, row polymorphism, nils, dead codes, call graphs, aliasing, these are all like in there and working. Um, I have a memoization step I've done in Henry Milner that I think is unique, that may, may improve the asymptotic time. It seems to help my normal run times, typing times, which are actually really good. Um, I've done the, the data flow typing for like what you get out of C or Java with a greatly extended lattice for typing. This is a very unusual way to approach typing these systems. But let's be do things like do flow typing on final fields, for instance, um, and flow typing for question mark colon operators doing nils and instance ofs and things like that. And I took both of these typing systems 
describe them as a monotone analysis framework, and that's a good wiki article if you don't, you know, don't know what that means, and I combine them as such, um, which makes them makes the combination theoretically stronger than either. So Henley Milner can't type things with dead code that doesn't type, and my Henley Milner can. And my flow typing can't type things that require parametric polymorphism, and my flow typing can because it actually does, Henley Milner does it for it. And then the two talk to each other back and forth in a good way, in a strong way, in a theoretically stronger way. So that's a deep typing theory talk that maybe this is not the right audience to go down. I'm happy to go down it though. Uh, I've gone down it a bunch with a bunch of theoreticians. I think I'm on the right path. I think I have it in fact solved, but I have more testing to be done. But then it's, I'm finishing up the typing system hacks. So the other major feature I want in the system here is a cost model for everything. So no surprise, expensive operations. So disk of point two is going to guarantee be a static dispatch because I can always resolve the overloaded, the, the, the yeah, overloaded function call every time. So the, no more overhead than a function call unless if the optimizer goes to town inlines. But you know, I don't promise that. That's not in the typing system. Whereas point two dot disk might be a virtual call. So you get virtual call costs are less which might be less because you might get inlining and inline caching and so on and so forth, but you, you don't get a guarantee of it. You will get a guarantee if you don't overload the dist call. Uh, in my example in here, I did overload it, so no guarantees on performance here. And in particular, if you don't see a pair of open close parens, you don't have a function call. There are no hidden function calls here. And, and some people will love it and some people say, but I want my, I don't know, getters and setters baked in and I want my, I don't know, parameters or, or God knows what, people have things they want. Currently, I'm in a state of no hidden function calls. We can argue, you know, what's a function call and what's not a little bit more there, but I want to make it obvious syntactically you have a function call. So cost model keywords then. This brings me to the notion of sometimes I want syntactic sugar. It's very convenient. I love it. Okay, great. Um, sometimes I want to go fast and the syntactic sugar is slow. In particular, if I have a terabyte log file I'm reading and I say java buffer.read.readline, I get a string. For every one byte I read from my file, I inflate it to two bytes for a string. That's two bytes of memory bandwidth to bring in an empty cache line to hold a string. The string dies within a line, so it gets written out in two more bytes. After I did a buffer.readline, I never said new, by the way, I just said buffer.readline. I said string split, which for every bytes of string I have, I get another set of bytes on the split strings plus object headers for them all, plus an array to hold them all. And suddenly I'm on 10 to one ratio of bytes read from disk to memory bandwidth. And that's where all my performance goes. And I teach a class where I demonstrate this on your laptop. You can watch a five to one speed up by just getting rid of allocation. I want compiler support to say, and here, don't allocate. Everywhere else, yes, allocate, make my life easy. Here, don't allocate. Or at least tell me you're allocating so I can pick on a case by case basis. Give me compiler support. Give me compiler support for autoboxing for heap closure, for I have accidentally escaped this pointer to the heap and, and suddenly everything got permanently lifetimed and blew out the GC or whatever. There's a bunch of these things you, you might think about. Which brings me to the notion of other interesting lexically scoped keywords that are part of the typing system. Keywords like only uses trusted computing base, doesn't do any foreign function calls, all your exceptions are handled, never calls sys.panic, all external modules he calls are also in the trusted computing base, things like that. Which brings me to things like does not throw, and uh, therefore, all exceptions are caught somewhere, which I'm thinking I'm going to require a module boundary to have that property so that when you cross a module boundary, you have to check an error code, but you don't expect to have a function, uh, a throw happen at you. But another keyword might be does not block because you're doing reactive coding and you want to know that this thread, which is managing my, my application screen, my, my phone application screen, wants to not be blocking accidentally on me. Um, I want to know, right? Okay, brings me around to object lifetimes. What do I do here? There's a bunch of obvious choices. I list three, Rust style, ref counting, garbage collection, some combination. Sometimes I want one, sometimes I want the other. So this implies that I have a backing target machine I have to pick, which has garbage collection or not as part of the target. Um, why keywords are something like effects? Well, I don't know what the difference is, but the effects go on the type. So it's a type keyword, if you will. This is, I'm answering a question. Um, somewhere I have a piece of text that says no GC. Where does it go? What's the semantic meaning? Yeah, an effect would be like in your function declaration, you say that this yeah. can't throw or it can't throw. Right, right. That would be, is my opinion, that would be on the function type. So yeah. I would be part of the typing system. Do you, do you have effects on your function? I types? have function types. I have function types that can take extra parameters like does not call outside trusted computing base. Is that an effect? I don't know. Okay. Right. The, the, the typing system is different because I have different capabilities. The lattice lets me do things that you can't do in other languages and doesn't necessarily freely support other things that you expect. So I have a very potent lattice 
that I haven't explored all the possibilities that come out of that. I think I can get effect like things out of this setup, but I don't claim that yet. Um, for instance, I think I can infer rust lifetimes in many, many cases. And where I can't, you probably need to change your code around so that I can if you want to do a rust like allocation instead of a GC like allocation. Um, I do like the notion of rust style lifetime management for places where I just want to say it doesn't ever allocate more than X, right? Some, there's some notion of, of limiting how much allocation is happening here for fixed size machines. Um, does allocate rather than their negations. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I don't care if you do the positive or negative variance of these. For me, the typing system would declare them the same. They would be the same either way. Um, I do like destructors as a separate topic. I like destructors. So this would be an obvious scope lifetime management. I like it way better than try finally because for try finally, I have to go and write the word finally and everything I did, I have to undo. And I have to duplicate the code once for the did and once for the undo. So I'll have some sort of you know structure that I make, just a standard structure whose annotation says this can only be allocated on a scoped lifetime, and it has a function call that will be called when it goes out of scope. This is how I've done this in C for Hotspot. It worked out great. I love it. I'm going to do it again. Tagged unions, um, they're basically single inheritance with less syntax. I've used them a bunch, they're kind of nice. I'm going to have them. I haven't got the syntax worked out. Here I threw down an example. It's a bad one. I need a better syntax. Um, one of the things that happens here is that small integers, single constant integers are also types. It's type three is the type three, the subclass of type int eight, subclass of type int 16, 64, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it means that a Friday as a four won't be confused with a four-year-old age. Exceptions. OK, I would love exceptions to be exceptional, except that my experience, they're not. Um, so I want to make it easy to do something not exceptions and hard to misuse exceptions. But I probably need exceptions because they do solve a certain class of problems well. So tag union returns, like an OK and a value or an error and some error thing. Um, as a as an encouraged, easy to use syntax. But then for all those non-local exits, um, I'm thinking I have a couple of variations I want to support. One is the exceptions passing through me. I want to note that I might want to log it. I'll shoot you if you log it because you're going to get logging anyhow. So why are you logging twice? You cannot change the exception, throw it away and rethrow it, or otherwise mutilate the exception so that I can't tell what the root cause of the problem was per se. Um, but maybe you do some local cleanup, and then the old exception keeps going. Or I'm going to declare I'm a top-level handler. The exception stops here. I do handle it completely, totally. I'm a web server. Some web handling page I called blew out on me. I'm going to handle it. I'm going to clean up what I can. I'm going to let GC get the rest, and I'm going to go again. But I'm not going to rethrow this exception or pass it along in any way. So I'm going to distinguish those two use cases. You can always mutilate, go around them, and rethrow anyhow. Everyone can because it's a Turing complete language. So what the hell? But I want to make it convenient to do the right thing here. Probably there's a sysstop panic call, especially for convenience, because I don't want to deal with the situation. So just get me out of here. I'll probably actually have a syntax I didn't write down here. I should the dot 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 is the the throw and acceptance as unimplemented. So I can just write if something does something good, else I don't know how to handle it now. Dot dot dot. What does an array out of bounds error do? Does it throw in an exception? Yeah, right now I don't want you to have to handle it. I, I did the language where you have to handle it every time. It sucks. So you're going to throw. Therefore, you get an exception as an arrange check, error out of bounds. Yes, absolutely. Now, what do you do with that? Well, do you want to have it throw across the module boundary or does the module want to blow up and say, I die now? I can't handle this. So I'm kind of saying stop it at a module by just having the fucking catch handle turn an error, return an error message. You did a top level handle of all exceptions, including the one you didn't expect. You said, I die. I didn't, I didn't do your request. Here you go. You know, and the next guy up gets to decide, look at the error code and say, geez, it didn't work. And now what do I do? And, and what does module boundary here mean? Does that mean like a dynamic boundary or is that like, you know, you're calling across you know, from the, my package to the math library or something? Yeah. Package boundaries, modules, packages. See, I don't have a definition of modules. That's actually that's eh, coming up in a slide or two, but okay. keep, keep going. Sorry. Okay, fine. Uh, concurrency, I don't know. I've done a bunch of concurrency routine things in my life, including bare threads, actor models. I have screwed with coroutines. I like the pony style ownership roles. I think I can infer them. I hope I can. I hope they play well with Rust style lifetime management. H2O project, they did a lot of cool stuff with continuation passing style. They turned into super high performance, super low latency, super efficient, small, you could micro task with CPS style. Um, it was really good. Um, I don't want to lose that goodness. I don't want to 
code myself in a corner where I can't implement it. Maybe I supply something of that to you as a default. Here's how I do distributed parallel concurrency. Maybe not. I don't know yet. Um, I want to get my single threaded and, and typing sorted, and then I'm going to add concurrency in a unified way that I haven't decided what that is. I definitely want to have some way to do auto parallelization on collections um, and, and some way to write those parallel iterators as well. So there'll be a semantic for a for loop that's a for parallel that does a bunch of things in concurrently in parallel that's easy to use and easy to write. Um, but there's probably also going to be some way to launch a forkable independent task that comes back to you at a later point, which is what the CPS style at H2O came around to. That was very convenient. Shared memory somehow. Um, actors go to message passing without shared memory, but that misses a key use case of a parallel shared common cache backing over like your database and the like. Um, big shared caches are a really good model to have. So not sharing will be the default. You will not cross thread share by default. You can get shared memory straight up. Okay, memory model. Surely something close to the Java memory model, except I had this final write thing versus final fields, little twist. And CAS will be a first class citizen, not buried inside, unsafe, or wrapped in an atomic field update or whatever. I haven't got the syntax I want to do there. It's probably sys.cas, except that all my, what do you call it, L values in the old C syntax don't mesh well with a function call syntax. So it probably is a bare operator because it does something you can't get any other way. So you probably have to have a CAS as a special syntax. Locks and volatiles spin on the concurrency model. Something will happen to make that work, but it depends on what the concurrency model is. Maybe it's shared memory when you ask for it and actors win mostly by default. That's a reasonable model. I've talked a lot with uh, Cameron Cordy about ecstasy. He has a stronger safety model around this, which I kind of like. So I might lean on some of his work with the ecstasy programming language there. Other open type questions. Um, I think I can play some new tricks with my typing system. So user defined lattice extension types. So like Kotlin does this knowable, not knowable, um, but maybe user extensible. So this code blocks or it doesn't, or maybe it blocks, or I don't know yet. And the typing system will tell me it's going to block or not. Or oh, my locks are nested in rank order, or I'm using physical unit math in the type system directly. So I get typing errors if I misuse my physical math. Um, I think I could do that as a user extensible type system. Separately, there's mix-ins or interfaces or traits. Um, something has to happen here. Because I do structural typing, you get a lot of the interface like effect like effects if you don't do anything else. Because if you match the interface, you do, and then it works. But if you want to have a named interface, do I demand you name the interface before you call a named interface function? I don't know. Yeah, in my opinion, the interface, the difference between interface and a structure is whether or not you did a new allocation of an object or not. Bunch of open module questions. Some kind of module system, yes, but I don't know what. Um, so right now I'm thinking module is just a struct. It's a top level variable, holds a struct, has fields. The fields hold on to functions or important constants um, like sys.print or sys.numcpus um, or start thread or something. I don't know. Math.square root, math.man, whatever. There's a bunch of these you can imagine. Um, not answering questions about module composability, productizing, looking over the code base and pulling out all the modules and the version numbers you're doing. Those are like open questions. Somewhere you start to go outside the language domain and into the product build domain. And you want to have the module system play nicely with the you know, various kinds of product build domains. But it's not necessarily a language thing. Um, currying, uh, it's easy to implement. It's easy to write. The typing system totally supports it. Currying by accident sucks. I have done a per Elm as a language which curries by default and you would forget an argument. Instead of getting an answer, you got a function waiting for an argument and you would pass that along three layers deep and pass a few arguments in getting functions expecting arguments and before you finally got the typing errors. Pain in the neck to debug. Um, so some syntax to buy into currying, not by default, but you can ask for it if you want it. And probably demand named currying, named argument currying. Um, so you name the arguments you're filling in or you name the arguments you're missing, something like that. <laughs> And then you, know, you get a function bar, which is just a foo with some arguments named and some arguments missing. Var arg syntax, got to have it. Probably just you know, something with an array is a trailing array. Some sort of default argument syntax for those guys who have a billion arguments and you don't want to specify them all the time. Um, those are more specialized use cases. But if you look at Java, places where people want to have default arguments and don't have a large argument count, 
they end up with like 20 variants of the constructors with different counts of arguments. And it's kind of obnoxious. These are sort of less important, interesting, less important use cases. I guess var args is kind of important for printf. Um, other questions like pattern matching. I like it. I've used it. It's good. It'll happen. I don't want to do with it. Eval and backtick are going to happen. Um, evals, another way to get class for name. It's maybe what your module import uses under the hood. I don't know. Some sort of big integer thing we in a library. It's not going to be the default. Some sort of public private, some sort of way to control access, maybe leading underscores is private or not. Um, strings. I like simple strings with known cost models and high performance. Um, whereas the the Unicode H strings where I say get a car ends up having to have a second loop buried because if you get one of the starters to a Unicode car, you have to do things weird. Suddenly your performance falls in the toilet. Um, and it's a mystery if you're not used to having fast high performance strings. So I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe a couple different types of strings. One that's a Unicode flavored, one that's string-like for pattern matching, for looking for ASCII-like characters, for using a wad of bytes. Um, and maybe the right answer is strings are for looped for per bytes as a wad of bytes and for looped for characters as Unicode. I don't know yet. But something along those lines is going to happen. OK, that was sort of ran out of things. How, how are we doing here? Oh, oh yeah, perfect. About, uh, at the right point, we should, we should pause here. Um, so what I was thinking is we would get Chris to, to chime in for a few minutes and then have a discussion, questions, and all that. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, Cliff, that was a great talk. Thank you for sharing everything you've been working on. It's really cool. Um, I'm not exactly sure how best to facilitate a discussion here. Um, I was kind of tricked into this by on, but <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very happy to be here. So that's not a bad thing. Um, I guess by background, an aspect of what I've done is uh, I built the Swift programming language and I've been through a lot of what Cliff is currently struggling with. And I have a lot of experience I can share with that. Um, can I can, depending on what format you want to do, I can ask Cliff lots of hard probing questions to to like get to the next state of evolution of AA. Um, I could talk about Swift and the design decisions we made. Um, I, I can also geek out about compatible design, which Cliff and I have tons of common experience in very different worlds, it turns out. But I would like to hard probing questions. To talk about? What, what's that? What are you most eager to talk about after? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to have fun talking with Cliff. I mean, he's, he's like a god, so it's, <laughs> it's not that bad. Okay. I'm just so, me, damn it. <laughs> so what were the, the decisions Swift made that depart from what we've heard so far? Where, where, what are the biggest differences? Um, I would grossly characterize AA as coming from the JVM worldview. And so I think that this is, I say this in the, you know, things pervasively throw exceptions. Um, the boxing reference model is not super clear to me, but it seems like it's very kind of Java-esque. Um, things like this. Swift, Swift is coming at it from much more of the, we get high performance predictably. Some, some of the same goals, but like you never have a virtual method unless you opt into it. Like that's, there, there's no implicit things like that, for example. Um, there's, uh, you know, a hard divide between value types and reference types, like cl classes and structs are a hard divide. Um, you have, uh, Swift is a uh, syntactic sugar over LVM language. And so all the operators are defined in the standard library. There's no built-in magic things like that. Um, uh, I mean, there, there's a bunch of different dif differences. I mean, Swift is also now 10 years old, and so it's like mature in production, and it's kind of a different phase. But I think that Cliff's working on a whole bunch of different pieces of AA that just are kind of all coming together. So, so one of the, uh, the questions in the chat is touching on the value versus reference cost model. And I think Swift has, uh, has made some interesting choices there. Sure. Well, so how about I start by asking Cliff some questions and then, yeah, I mean, I'm also super happy to talk about Swift, of course, but um, so, so Cliff, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest hinge I see on where you're going with this is this whole type system piece, right? So this, this is where you put a bunch of your energy into so far. Um, and you're making these, like you have this goal of it's, it's kind of linear time. And with it, respect it, yeah. to the size of the program, right? Because you're going to be yeah, it's very close to linear, unless you do the weird Henry Milner cases that cause the blowout. Like Henry Milner has a cubic or worse; it has some something horrible. In oh, practice, oh. it's close to linear. Well, so so, but do you support overloading of methods or functions? Yeah, limited overloading. Yes. And do you so, for example, operators? You can have like matrix plus matrix, for example. Yeah, right. Matrix plus float, so that you can like add a scalar onto your matrix, kind of thing. Right. 
Yeah. So the, the challenge with that is that then you immediately get exponential blow up of your type system. <laughs> well, so that's the question because I, I I'm not I'm not necessarily coming at it in the same way, and I'm, I'm certainly not seeing an obvious exponential blowout. Now you might get the you you don't have to tile the entire uh, uh, type space with overloads. So the, the blowout in my head shouldn't be worse than the count of overloads, not the exponential of overloads. Well, so, so I mentioned plus because just hard, hard one experience is that plus and Swift has something like 28 overloads just in standard library. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, fun. fine. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a thing to not walk into with, with you know, surprised eye, you know, open eyes or whatever. Walk in with open eyes. Well, yeah, and so you, you get things like, you get the symmetric ones like, you know, int plus int equals int and things like this. Yeah. Um, you then get uh, pointers, so pointer plus int equals pointer and stuff. And so you, you end up with this in, in Swift, each of the integer types is a distinct struct in the language. And so you get you know, one for each thing. Um, and so the consequence of this is that when you get an expression like a plus b plus c plus d plus e, <laughs> right, then you right. get you get an exponential blowout of the number of permutations that are possible there. Um, and so it's just something to, be, to watch out for as you're bringing up the type system, particularly as you get to generics and um, a, you know a subtype relationships. Subtype relationships get very complicated because it, it explodes the search space for overloads and everything else. Yeah, um, I hear you. So, so the current thing I'm doing is the overloads go to the, the lattice involved for the flow typing is symmetric in an unusual way maybe. And the overloads go to the high end of the symmetry as a bit vector. And then they fall on a lattice sort of monotonically in a straightforward way. And I claim that I have a reasonable running time, which is bounded by the number of falls, which is the count of overloads. Um, Henley Milner doesn't care well, so, or see that per se. Well, so, so the major difference of a Java slash C type system and a Henley Milner type system is you get bi-directional type inference. Yeah. So you closure some yes. type check and stuff like this. And yes. because of that bi-directionality, you don't, it makes everything more complicated algorithmically. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's why I said it's been the last six months working on this. I'm a really strong algorithm guy. <laughs> it took me a while. I think I have it. And that's a deep, long talk. I'm happy to go. But that would not necessarily uh, uh, be accessible to everyone in the audience. Sure. Other question. Like, the, you mentioned int. Is int 32 bits? Or is it machine? No. Or? No. In, int is 64. But I have typed ints. I have, I have, I have length ints. So there's int 1, 2, you know, power of 2, actually any number. Right now, I have the power of 2s. But I'll just do any number up to 64. Probably there'll be a 128 and a couple others, but those will, those will turn into library calls. And, and what is the type of like 42 or zero or things like this? Are yeah, they... okay, so 42 is an integer type as a singleton int that is a subtype of int eight, which is a subtype of int 16 and then da, 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 da. So you pick the, the tightest, smallest integer type, which is then a subtype of all the greater, larger ones, is that the idea? Yes, so, so yeah, yeah. This is this is the typing system can do ranges. It doesn't have to be bit counts. It can do a bunch of things, and they they just subtype in the obvious way. And then in, integers are subtype of floating point or up to the main no. system of the floating point. No, because it's a lattice, you don't have a tree. Right. So int fifty seven is a subtype of float sixty four, but int fifty eight is not, because one does not have a pure injection into the other, mm -hmm. because you get overflow bits. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So. Uh, small integer values are simultaneously and ambiguously floats and int, small ints and bigger ints and bigger floats and everything else. And that's all handled sort of naturally by the typing system. So I can throw a three down and pass it to a float function or an int function, and the typing system will claim the three is, uh, is ambiguously both an int and a float and works perfectly well in either context. Okay. So that's, that's a little different. There's not an implicit, I converted you from int to a float or a float to an int directly there. Um, Whereas as soon as I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine with a L, so it's a long, whatever, big ass thing, that's not gonna be any float 32. Get enough digits, it won't be a float 64 either. Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm curious about the semantics of your closures. Um, so yeah. with your closures, uh, so you gave an example of like the recursive closure. Uh, yeah, factorial in, on one of those. Factorial, lines. right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, to be true closures, you need to be able to capture your context. Yeah, I should give examples of that too. And so, even in the factorial example, like you're the you're defining an immutable value fact, and then uh, I blew the share. I want to go different slides. Yeah, fine right. function. Here's fact. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and so so how does how does the capture of fact itself work here? 
Yeah, okay. So fact is, the parser comes along and says fact is a left-hand side of an assignment. So it's a local variable. Um, it's being assigned a function. I, I, I lot it off. I, I, I'm, I'm walking through, oh, I come across fact. That one is currently a forward reference. So I, I hang on to it as a forward reference type. As long as the forward reference type gets defined before the end, for the next use of it, um, then I'll, I'll just declare it as a forward reference. I think you're talking about typing rules though, but like, how does it execute? Like, what is the runtime representation of that closure? Does it store a pointer? Oh, oh. The, 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 the factorial, the typing boils fact down to the same function. The typing system totally supports uh, self cyclic types, self-referential types, cyclic types, and functions and structs and pointers and every other way. So that is a, a function call to itself in the typing system. And right, right. No, no, no. I'm not asking about the typing system. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so, but the execution just calls itself. That, that's a, you're asking for an operational model. I don't have an execution model, but I, I do actually have an operational model how I expect executions to happen. And the execution will do a recursive call. Now, having said that, I do tail, clo uh, uh, tail call elimination. So if I reverse the, you know, I do the multiply afterwards here. It's not the tail call position. I guess no, this, I, 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 so I this does a recursive I, call. I understand the compiler transformations, but I, I guess, so in this case, you have a, Trivially recursive function fact, right? But yeah, on yeah. the other hand, you could presumably have a closure that closes over a different function. Yeah, you know, it's like, like is odd and is even are mutually self recursive. Is odd says it's if you're zero, you're odd or even, and otherwise you call is odd minus x minus one and vice versa, whatever. Mutually right. recursive functions. But I guess what, what I'm asking is like in the operational runtime implementation yeah. of this, thing, not in the typing rules, uh, yeah. like okay. there's a mode in which you have to capture a function pointer. Yes. <laughs> Just, just like you have to capture a local variable if you refer to it from a closure, right? Yeah, so let's, let's separate out code pointers from closures. So fact is trivially recursive, doesn't have a closure requirement. Whereas make counter totally has a closure requirement. So in, in, the, in the normal case, I, I'm going to tell you at typing time that you've typed that you need a closure or you don't. So I can do keywords on them saying this is this is going to do a stack allocated closure or it's not, or it's going to do an upward. So, so some of these will do upwards, several different versions that are going to be implemented. Many of this I'll know at typing time. So you have a local frame that's only ever locally referenced as you expect out of C code. You'll have oh, upwards awesome. exposed frames where you can go poke your caller, caller's frame because you've captured your caller. You have- so, Yeah, the, the, the challenge with that, so that makes total sense. That's effectively how C++ uh, lambdas work, right? C++ yeah. lambdas right. does. Is an anonymous struct or something, right? And right. so now the challenge is when you have, and I'll map on the C++ terminology, uh, you know, you have, you have a function, you have to take an SVD function, right? You have I to mean, take a what function? Like an SVD function, right? So you have to go from one of the specific types you have on the call site to a type erased version of that. And so the type erased version okay. of that doesn't know what flavor of thing you're passing in and whether it has a capture list or not. And you generally want composability across uh, the callers and callees, typically. Right, so, okay, so, so, so I'm hearing a couple different things getting mixed in here. And so maybe I'm not hearing it right. Um, the, the, the... I guess, I guess what, what, what I'm trying to get at is that, so there, there, it's, it's relatively easy to find what we want out of a special case. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly, exactly. And of course, it's, it's a C function, right? You know, it's... Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but then there's, there's the core model, right? The core right. model that then works in the general case and then right. how do you derive the special case out of it, right? And so yes. what, I'm, what I'm trying to ask about is what is the core model, which is the general case. And from that, when you can define that, and this gets down to like you pass by value or reference, right? And things like that yeah. that are fairly core to the operational right. model of the system here. So this is right now, this is passed by reference. The, you can access your caller's frame. Okay. There's, uh, I, I get the, the Henley Milner parametric polymorphism out of this. So mm -hmm. I have a strong notion of who I'm calling and what. And the, the one place that sort of makes a difference is I want to have my primitives be not boxed by default. So they become raw. So then I end up having a couple different overloaded variants of some of these functions where the types are the various primitives as the yeah. overloads. So they're that I can. Special like they're in Java. And then if you define a complex number, it's boxed. Or do you have the ability to find a complex number that is just as efficient as an int? Or as, yeah, as right. So, so, so right now I'm not, uh, um, I'm not doing object inlining per se, and I haven't decided what to do with the the complex case. So that's a good one. Um, so it would be boxed by default. 
And instead, I'm likely to hand you a convenient way to take arrays of complexes and rotate them 90 degrees. A destructive array instead of array of struct. So maybe because your, your array. arrays are like a, the element is a pointer or something like that instead of being the value in line. Yeah. Th so the element becomes, yeah, in instead you, 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 but this doesn't give you an actual complex object if you do the destructive arrays. It gives you the base of the whole structure and an index into it as how you get at the object which is not the same thing, right? And then you have to reify it or copy, collect or whatever. And probably that's the model I'm heading for. Mm -hmm. There is a version that says that I can do object inlining, um, except that that impacts, like do I have references in the middle of other objects, which impacts GC and the like, mm -hmm. which I, I don't want to go to. I see you shake your head. It's good because I've been there. Mm -hmm. I, see you go there. Like, I mean, this is, this is the familiar model when you're coming from the Java style system where you're pervasively referenced. And so yeah, right. sure these tricks, I mean, you know better than anybody here probably how to do all this stuff. Right, right. So then there's a version that says, I want to valueize this thing, which is what I think you're coming at. Yeah, it comes back to the predictable, complex. predictable cost model. Right. So the yeah, it goes to the cost model. Com complex is a small enough thing that I could usefully make it a value object and pass it around. The error comes if I make a large thing a value object and begin passing around large things. If I can make that difficult to do by mistake, like doable if you want to, here's my terabyte pile of data. Please pass it by value. Well, OK. This is the R problem, where you pass giant arrays by value by mistake. Well, there, there are good solutions to that, right? So but the, uh, I mean, but again, it comes down to the what does, what are you, what are you copying? <laughs> and when? Well, that's what, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't want to have a mystery cost model, which says, I did a copy and write hack, so it was mostly cheap until I made a mistake. And then I copied my terabyte, and I blew out, right? Yeah, have you considered something similar to the Swift model? Because it nails all this really cleanly. And it gives okay, you what I read on the Swift model was we do copy on write, and which works great until I accidentally touched it. And then, and then I made a giant copy of a giant thing. And I didn't know what my cost was because of that. That's, um, what, that's, what I, that's what I was leery of. I didn't read it in the Swift model how I could be hard guaranteed that it's treated as a value object. It's passed by reference, yes. But if I ever mutate it, I got a private copy because that's what value semantics imply. Mm -hmm. Except that the private copy was expensive, the first mutation, and cheap, the later ones, or something. So there's some cost that looks unusual to me there. If we can nail down the cost model for when I make a mutation of a value thing. Yeah, can, can, I, can, I, can I clarify what actually happens here? Yeah, so, so, so in Swift, the, the difference is that um, virtually, like, as much as possible gets pushed into the library, <laughs> right? And so when, some, when somebody talks about what happens in Swift, usually they're talking about choices made by the standard library. But... The, the core language does have these inherent rules on how the, the core model works that then the libraries compose on top of the course, right? And so, um, so in Swift, there's a whole world of classes, which I'll ignore, but classes are reference semantic. They're, they, you can opt into virtual dispatch on methods and like all that kind of stuff. And so right. they're, they're much more close to the Java style object model and things like that. Um, structs are the other side of this and Swift really encourages the use of value, value types. So structs are always inline. So they're always in line on your stack, or they're in line in, inside of an array. And so they're always dense, even if they're like 10 fields or something like that, they're 10 fields in line in your array and they're consecutive and you get good memory system performance. Um, structs are always copied by shallow copy. Mm -hmm. So if you copy a struct, so you have your, your complex number, then it just passes two, two fields right, and registers. And yeah. so that, that's- Yeah, that's complex all. is a good case for this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Well, that, that's typically the case where the, the pervasively referenced semantic world kind of um, Java, Java has other challenges with this too, but um, but so when you do this now, the question is, how do you build collections, right? So Swift, one of the things that uh, we chose to do is to make it so that uh, collections have value semantics, right? So value semantics are something that is an extension over the pure mutability that you get in a functional programming model. It's more powerful and it's more compatible with modern memory, sub memory hierarchy performance kinds of stuff. Um, and what it means is that you you pass around an array just like you pass around an int <laughs> or in a machine learning world like you pass around a tensor and right. you don't have to worry about right. aliases of your tensors and you have to clone them and things like this right now with that the question is how do you implement that yeah c++, c++ also has value semantics for something like std vector and if you pass an std vector around then it eagerly copies the thing <laughs> right? right and so c++ you see people passing everything by cause const reference really undermining a lot of the safety that you get by a value semantic model right and so what swift does you're referring to is you get uh, what's called copy on write, or it's implemented with copy on write. This gives you value semantics for um, things like the array type, the dictionary type, stuff like that. Now, um, that gives you a really nice and very predictable model. Um, 
it composes extremely well, works really great with concurrency and a bunch of other higher order things. Um, but the, the key thing that's nice about it is that it's, it's extremely predictable. And you know, a struct is always passed by copy and it's always a shallow copy, right? And so because of that, you don't have things like the C++ copy constructor thing where, you know, depending on what you copy around, it could be extremely- Yeah, I'm not, not, or, yeah I'm not doing copy constructor games. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, sorry, but, but, but I, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is a library decision. And so Swift also has like, you know, C pointers and C pointers are called unsafe pointer in Swift. And so you can have, you know, you can call malloc and call free and directly interrupt with existing C nonsense. And uh, those obviously have reference semantics and you can find your own types that do whatever you want. Sure. So the question becomes, you know, having passed this large collection around by value semantics and then somebody makes a mutation, you know, what did you end up copying? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so this is but something- Cost of the mutation. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is, this, is, this is like one of the really fundamental questions of large scale system design. And so if you look at, so I, I have a lot of experience in the, the Objective-C world, right? Objective-C and Java were co-developed through the 90s together, learning from each other. And so in, uh, in both Objective-C and Java, you have this challenge of saying like, okay, I'm just find a person class, <laughs> okay? And I have a first name and a last name, right? And so when I get my person class, um, somebody passes me in my first name, somebody passes me in my last name, right? Now those strings in the case of, uh, of uh, uh, Objective-C, but in Java, the same is true of arrays and other things like this, those strings are mutable. Right. Not so Java. In Java, fine. Switch it to an, you take an array of friends or something. <laughs> like the array is mutable, right? And so, and so the question is like you you capture this as part of your person. Okay. Now, what happens if somebody else has a pointer to this string or pointer to the array, right? And then they mutate it underneath the covers. Well, yeah. that could, that could break your invariance, right? Because you could be yeah. hashing on that, and suddenly yeah. your hash code changes or whatever, right? Right. And right. So yeah. You're you're mixing sort of two different questions here. One is what is the safety guarantee I get out of value no, standard? No. No, no, what, what I'm saying, what I'm saying no, 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 I'm, I'm answering both questions at the same time, right? Oh, so okay. the, the thing the thing that you end up doing in a Objective-C or Java style system is you decide, I know globally that nobody will mutate this thing after they pass it to me. And so it's a contract of the API that people yeah. promise that. And therefore you're hoping, you know, but you're basing your safety guarantees. Uh, yeah, I, I can that. give you that guarantee. I can give you that guarantee in the typing system that I have in AA that you, you will not mutate it. So let me just finish the thought and then I'm, yeah. I'm curious. So the, the other thing you do is you say, okay, well, I'm building a large scale API. I don't know how my clients are going to use them. I can't assume that they're, they know everything. And so what I will do is I will eagerly copy the string or array yeah. when the, when the object's allocated, right? And so what yeah. value semantics do, so, and so the challenge with that is now you're burning performance to get safety yeah. <laughs> or you're right. giving up safety to get performance, right? And this, this, this is the dynamic there. Yeah. And the reason, the reason the eager copying is bad is obviously many people will not Actually mutate them. I understand right? why you were copying. The yeah. They're handed off to you and you're done, right? Yeah, right. And so, and so what uh, what lazy copying does and what copy and write does uh, in deep lazy copying, because it all composes correctly, is it says, okay, well, you get a copy if and only if you actually mutate the thing after you pass it off, right? And otherwise, you know, copying around your your name, your array, or whatever it is you're putting in, you're just like copying four pointers for your array. And that's it when you're done, <laughs> right? Well, but now if somebody goes and mutates the thing, well, sure. They're going to mutate it either way, right? Now you're paying cost proportional number of unique instances of the thing you have, and it's actually very nice that you get the exact right number of copies of things, and you don't so, have to so, worry about that. And it composes in a modular way. So if I pull out Rust style tag referencing on on lifetime management, and I claim that I'm in, in the model where people are well behaved and they make some referenceable thing, array of friends or whatever, and then they pass it off, and their goal is to be done and not screw with it again, I can capture that notion in the typing system directly. There's a really fundamental difference here, which is that when, again, it's, just, it's the, the context and the culture of where things are coming from. So Swift was coming from a context of large scale API design, right? And yeah. when you're dealing with large scale API design, um, like, you know, iOS APIs and things like this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the thing you have to watch out for is that local guarantees quickly get broken when people write new code. And so if I have my person class, for example, and I say, oh, I know that everybody will copy it when they get past No, no, it's not everyone will, the typing guarantees it. It will, be a it will be a typing error to call the person API with an array that you are allowed to mutate later. Right, but so, but whereas- so at the time that you get the but, typing but, error, you but, would correct but, it by saying, I have happens, to make a copy. But what, what happens is you break composition with layer, APIs that are layered on top, right? And Why? so if you, if you go with that design where you say it's yeah, an error yeah. for somebody to do this, and yeah. what you're doing is the next layer on top that doesn't know <laughs> if it's gonna be called in the right way or the wrong way has to do that copy. 
right? It has to do that copy to get the unique thing that it can then pass off to your person. To yeah, somebody has to do the copy and somebody knows they have to do the copy. And so, and and I so hear you saying, I'm, I'm gonna do reference counting and copy on write to do the copy. And I'm, I'm saying, I can tell from the typing system that I, I have to use the copy if I'm called this way and I don't and in this way. Right, but, but what the typing system does is it force it moves where the eager copy happens, but it puts yeah. an eager copy in a different place. Uh, it's not, no, no, it doesn't, it can delay it indefinitely just as what you're doing with your copy on write. It can keep that's delaying. That's harder it. though. Uh, that's harder Cliff, because yeah. if, you have, if you have any control flow merge in which one side does one thing, the other doesn't, your type system has to be some yeah, virtual calls that then you're sending perfect resolution of. And like, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of things that go into that. And if you're- Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hearing you. It's, it's, it's my reference, then you don't so, know. So, you know <laughs> if I could just just push one one in here, I think there's a there's an interesting experiment in the R programming language. So R has nothing to do with Swift or AA, but it has copy on write and um, reference counting. And one of the things, so we've been doing some analysis of how often is the copy unnecessary. So we do dynamic analysis and we see, you know, do you actually read that value after you've copied it? And quite a lot of the, the copies are spurious. It's just you have a reference to the, the, the argument in, a, in an R, you know, in some place, and now you need a copy, but really you don't because that reference will never be read. So, 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 the, so I think there's still, you know, neither is perfect. Well, so I, I don't know how the R implementation works. Does it do the standard reference count optimizations? So the, the key thing that you need to be able to do is you need to be able to release values early. No, it doesn't. So so that there it will be more you know that that's certainly a, a source. Of so the, the Swift lifetime rules allow like it doesn't have guaranteed deinitialization at the end of scope like C plus plus does. It allows the compiler to move the deinitialization up, right? And so what that means is that as you take a value, the, the typical thing is that if you pass say say your string is reference counted and it's arc, and it's uh, therefore copy on write, right? Well, the typical issue is like you take your string, you pass it as an, you, you construct it, and then you pass as an argument to the function, and then it gets, and then it's live for the rest of your function until the end of scope, even though you're not using it, right? And so in Swift, what ends up happening is the compiler just says, oh, okay, well, this thing isn't used, and so it pushes, pushes the initialization up to the function call, and then it turns the pass by copy into a transfer, the equivalent of an SD yeah, move. Right? Yeah, that, that's probably that's, the sort of level what we see. Yeah, yeah and so this Russ is what- Borrow Checker is doing something like that. But it's just saying that the user has decided that I can um, pass it into this function and declare I'm done as sort of an easy type annotation. No, uh, they're, they're, actually, they're actually completely different things. So the rest, the rest thing is enforcing that you have done the move <laughs> or you haven't used it after the move, right? Like that's, right, right. Well, but the, it's the same effect is what I'm coming around to. It, it, it's uh, passed sure. off to the other function and you're not going to use it again, even if technically it's in scope. Right, right, exactly. I mean, the, the, diff the, the difference here is it's putting on the burden on the uh, programmer to get the annotation. <clears throat> well, that was my question about can I do this inference? Because I certainly can do it in the type checking and tell you that you're not using it from this function end of scope. So therefore I'm gonna declare it, you know, infer it being dead past the function. And now it can just be passed into the function as owned by the function and the function gonna deal with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyways, I mean, there are definitely trade-offs here. And so I, I think that it's it's interesting to see that. And, and it's the, the fun thing about programming language design is that all of these these uh, issues like compose together in a very interesting way. And so um, right. it's fun to see what it looks like. Right, the, the, the thing that I'm pushing back on, and I don't, I don't claim that I'm right or wrong here, but I'm, I'm, my head is pushing back on is the, who pays the copy cost and do they know they're paying it and why they're paying it? If they know they're paying it and they know why they're paying it, then maybe it's fine. Um, and, yeah, and, so, and then it yeah. becomes more of an implementation question. How is it implemented under the hood versus how is it typed? And a bunch of questions have rolled through or comments have rolled through the, the comment sheet here. Yeah, why don't we go to some of those? So I, I have one sort of like higher level question. <laughs> why are why are we still inventing new programming languages? That's well, what, I went and asked that it's question. About ten years ago, somebody came to to my office and say said programming languages aren't isn't that a solved problem? Yeah, of course. I was a faculty candidate, and it was a very right. very cunning move <clears throat> to not be fired. So I went and looked for other programming languages for inspiration, for design choices, for whatever. And there are 20 or 40 brand new languages that I'd never heard of that are all in the last five years or less uh, up and coming and floating around. So is it a solved problem? Oh, of course. Right, does everyone else believe that? Well, apparently not. I'm not the only one who doesn't believe it. So maybe it's not actually solved. 
Well, so, I mean, I, I would turn around and say, uh, what's wrong with creating programming languages? Right? What's I wrong mean, with what? But what's wrong with creating a programming language? Like, what, what, what's, what's the best way to have fun with compilers and type systems other than building your own programming language? I mean, and, and I, I mean, to me, it's, it's you, you really learn something different by doing it than you do by reading about it. And so I think it's a, it's a fantastic thing to do. And if you make, if you, if you re implement Java or something, which, you know, is the, the standard thing for an intro to compilers class or something, right? Well, sure, you're learning about one set of design decisions, but if you open the box of design and you choose a different design point, well, that's when you really learn. And so I think that it should be encouraged for people to write a programming language. Now, getting it adopted by millions of people, that's a different deal, right? That, that's also a challenge, but... Um, I'll claim that Coffee Compiler Club has a dozen language geeks and almost all of them are writing their own language. So yeah. we have a bunch of people doing language design choices. It meets once a week. So I, 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 I play with R or I work with R or something. And uh, one of the things that I, I say is I'm trying to prolong the life of that language. Um, you know, like it lasted 25 years, it could do another 10 maybe. And the reason, the reason is that the size of the ecosystem. So, right, so you, you look at how many books in Amazon use R, for example, and you get thousands in biology, in finance. And you say, well, I'm going to propose a better language, say Julia, it's a, it's a great language. Now we are, we are going to have to rewrite those thousand books. So yes, there are costs to getting people excited about new languages. You're breaking all of that knowledge. Yep. And, yeah. what, what's, the, what's the most cool, exciting thing about the COBOL language? Well, it was the only language available you know, 50 years ago, yeah. 60 years ago. So you can't touch that. Yeah, but I also, I think that, again, the premise of the question here maybe is different than what I'm expecting because there's no no problem with creating a programming language. Like, yeah, yeah. If you want to build R++++, like, go for it. That's awesome, right? Yeah. The, the, to your point about there's a huge amount of value in the ecosystem and libraries and books and community and brain space and all this kind of stuff, right? That, that That's not a reason to not write programming language. language. That's just more reasons why getting something adopted is challenging, right? And so, um, so I, I, again, I think that it, it really depends on what your goals are, but... Uh, I, I'm surprised people don't bring up jitting or not the jitting here. Well, like, so I have to ask you about your REPL plus global type inference, right? Because oh yeah, that, that was that's working. Well, it's been working on and off. Currently, the REPL's busted. I know how to fix it. It'll be fixed. Well, well the, the thing I was going to ask you is that um, by nature of your type system, uh, the types change the more code you add. Yes. So like adding a method could cause you to have to retype everything. Yeah. Um. <laughs> no. No, so the funny game that's being played here is that I only monotonically have to roll forward from where I've typed so far. I don't have to retype from scratch. Right, but, but if you have subtyping relationships, then you call something with an int 64 and you call it with an int 30, um, maybe this is a bad example, but you call it with an int 32 and an int 64. And if you call it with an int 32 first, then you should type check it as taking an int 32, but then you pass it as an int 64 somewhere else. Don't you have to retype check the call you No. He'll type check as taking the, the most general type, N64 to N64. And N32 being a subtype is a valid type. So you wait, get, wait, a, wait, you, you get wait, a most general type. You can well, keep well, training them. I know that, that, that makes sense. Like that's the lattice working, right? But yeah. if you type check when you've only seen the N32 use. Yeah. Now right? you're asking an implementation question. Do I want to make a custom version that runs fast for N32 only? Ah, eh, you know, maybe. But the, the generic type didn't roll backwards. Uh, so you're not upcasting from int32 to n64 when you call it. Oh, the 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 there may be a a yeah no the, the yes because actually I don't let you have a you did you, you yeah you can upcast there because it's a pure injection. Right, and so that, 32 then, is an n64 in all contexts. Right, and so and then when you get but I mean the challenge with that is you you're not covariant or con, you're not contravariant right because. Uh, if you pass in an int, like you have a thing that just does a plus, right? So the thing just does a plus takes two t's and returns a t. Um, the t you get back should be an n32 or an n64. Right? That's comes out of the Henry Milner side, and again, there's a there's a, a, a I, I get so far at least I'm getting the right types without having to retype Henry Milner backwards either. So I'll know that I have a 32 n32 n32 to n32 thing at this point. Um, right, but the question is, how do you if the execution model like? So you have food; it's typed as taking a t to t to t. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. 
how do, you, how do you compile foo, right? And what, what does it compile into? Or do you just specialize well, in it? I, I, foo then compiles down to an overload version that takes a 32, 32, 32, and I break the overloads when the 64 version shows up. I add a new overload and resolve it when the 64 shows up. Yeah, that, that, that's roughly what Rust does, right? Where it is a Rust or Julia or languages like this. And I mean, the challenge with that is that then you get, uh, you know, when you get to millions of lines of code, you get to compile time performance problems. <laughs> yeah, I, I looked at the Julia thing. The, the, those performance problems mostly stem from having something confusing with their type system going on that I'm thinking I'm dodging here. No, I mean, I mean, that, so Julia has complexity like any real language does, right? But but the fundamental issue is if you're relying on instantiation for your generic system, then you have code second file time problems, right? Because you have to instantiate all the things, and you get yeah. No, I only I, I, the theory for me says I only have to instantiate a unique copy for every primitive combo argument set. And I don't actually need a different version for the 32 and the 64. The typing system claims it's a different version. The implementation says same code. But how do you know whether you need a sign extension because you're like... Well, playing? because I, I'm cheating on the 32 side, I don't actually do 32-bit uh, math once you're... The, the, the integer sizes are limited to storage classes. So that's then, not a good example. But, but divide is a different operation if it's a 32 by 32 versus... No, no, I'm saying I, storage classes have small size for space reasons. Otherwise, you're a full 64-bit int. You don't get an int 32 divide by int 32. You get a 64-bit by 64-bit, which you can now so I'll, truncate to 32. I'll interrupt. Yeah. I'll interrupt uh, because there are a few questions that have piled up, and we should uh, answer our audience. So David is asking, any uncommon languages with fresh ideas that inspire you people and that people should know about? And he says, no, we don't have enough languages, exclamation well, mark. I mean, I one, yeah, one, one that Cliff mentioned is Pony. I mean, yeah. I think it was a really cool language. You want to talk about that, Cliff? Uh, well, mostly I'm grabbing out of Pony the concept that you can do a lattice-like uh, uh, sharing notion. I own something privately. I co-own it with other people. Um, I quit owning it. Another guy has ownership on it now on a different thread. Uh, and, and the way Pony does it, they guarantee no data races. I'm not certain that's the exact model I want, but the no data race thing is very cool. And, and there's a limited amount of extra annotations you have to do to hand things off, to publish things publicly on a multi-threaded system. So there's a concurrency thing Pony does that I, I like how that pans out. Yeah, so I, I also really love Pony. I think it's a, it's a really cool language for two reasons. One is the ownership model that I think you're talking about there with the effects yeah. system on. Um, you know, I know that it's not shared immediately, things like this. Um, the other is it's pushing the actor model. <laughs> and so, and Swift, Swift also has an actor model now and it, it eliminates data races and it does it in a very different way. And so um, we took inspiration from the actor model side of it, which was independent of its type system. And so it's, it's I think that Pony is a beautiful little language. It's really cool. Yeah, I haven't, haven't decided actor model or not the actor model, um, but I like some of the things you get out of the actor model. And there's a few key pieces it's missing. And then, then they get into some sort of half actor model, half something else model. And that's sort of the direction heading toward madness. So I haven't, haven't settled out yet. Yeah, actor models are not all made the same, of course, right? Just like anything, there's major differences. Um, the thing I love about the actor model is that um, I, I kind of make this analogy, it, it, like in Swift terminology, there's like, you know, you have, uh, you can invoke a function, you can define a function, and you can define a structure or class, right? And so the, the, this tower of capabilities here is the, you know, you define a function or a closure. Well, it's sure you can capture state, but it's really designed for I'm um, defining an operation, right? And the operation works on the parameters, and that's kind of what a function's about. If you get to a method now, the method is really about you define the state, all the different properties on this, the class and things like this, and then you define operations against that state, right? This is object orientation. And so the same thing on the concurrency side of things, like you can have closures and they can be in Swift has async await and things like this, so, so you don't block. And you have closures, which can be async. You have functions, which are async. But then if you want to get to the equivalent of a class that is uh, memory safe and race safe, then you have the actor as the equivalent there. And that actor is reference semantic, but then it also um, makes sure we don't pass <laughs> like wild pointers across different actors and things like that. I got an offer to talk about type systems from somebody, um, but maybe not right now, but yes. Like post me an email or Twitter. Yeah, drop an email or something. There's another question I wanted to get to from uh, Matt. Um, uh, he writes, uh, more on the value semantics and the cost model. Perhaps one design point to consider is to issue a compilation error for all cases where you cannot get deferred temporary materialization, i.e. guaranteed copy elision, 
and require explicit annotation from the programmer in such cases if they are rare enough. Yeah, that's that's actually closer to where I was heading. When I say Rust style, what I mean is you you own it, you don't own it, you know you're going to own it, you know you need a copy, or you know you don't need a copy. And if the compiler can't infer, but to preserve semantics, you have to say something. And here I'll take a copy. And this would be sort of similar and sort of different from what Chris is doing in the sense that it's all mostly under the hood, except except and doing it with the runtime via sort of counting. The type system mostly gets it, but the type system can't get it. You have to say something instead of silently get the copy with the cost. So you explicitly say, here, I'll eat the cost. Now, is that cost guaranteed, eager? That's the implementation strategy. And if you do some sort of ref counting, maybe it's delayed or night, not. But you know for a cost model that at this point, I might get a copy. And that's a cost model I can live with. The one that just says, I wrote to a field, oops, the field included a terabyte copy plus the one update, that's a cost model I can't live with. Yeah, I think it's also interesting to define what copy means because copies mean different things to different people, right? So is it, is it a deep copy? Is it a copy of a couple of pointers, right? Those kinds of things really, really do matter. No, no, just assume a shallow copy. I think that's fair. And then you recursively apply as necessary. I think that's entirely fair. Well, but, but a shallow copy of an object can have then shared pointers underneath to other things, right? Yes. So you're, in, in many cases, you'd be slicing off, slicing off part of an object graph. By doing that yeah, you have to. Yeah, you, you you've just agreed that you're you're taking a shared version of this piece, and a I've made a, a one layer in copy of this following piece, so I can mutate it and carry on. So I, I just like slice the hash table off of the buckets or something, right? I'm sharing the buckets. Well, that's, you know, well, that's what I'm that's what I'm asking. Suppose I hand you a terabyte hash table as a single array. Now you do a copy on write semantics. Boy, if you touch that with an update, you know it's going to blow you out. So oh, but suddenly your hash table has to be easily mutatable on a small basis. Uh, well, so, so I, I don't know, are we, are we talking about copy and write again? Um, <laughs> so yeah, something. we should stop from copy yeah, and write. Stop copy on that one. We, we've what agreed to garbage we collection. Yeah, so, 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 so Cliff, here's a different question. What, what is your most fun thing you're working on in this? Uh, on, on this stuff? Yeah. Like, what, what uh, part of this do you find the most interesting? Gosh, I've touched all of it. So, you know, it's all at different times. So right now I'm having fun integrating sort of forward flow, data flow typing and Henley Milner, which are these two very different paradigms. I've taken my Henley Milner, I've stripped it out from being a, a tree walk to being a, a work list. So it interleaves. I've declared it a monotone analysis framework. So I've, what monotone means and Henley Milner. I've integrated it, interleaved it with a forward flow typing game. I've got transfer functions that carry type information from one lattice to the other and back and forth so I get better answers. I'm writing sample code that can do shit I can't do in either type system. This has been fun. Now, having said that, playing with grammar is a lot of fun. Um, you know, I'm looking for a minimalistic syntax. I got way more minimal than most folks do. Are you a parser generator person or a hand, hand rolled parser person? Oh, only hand rolled. Me, me too. Small, uh, me too, so let me put devil's let me play devil's advocate on the other side. Like, how, how do you know you have you don't have uh, type ambiguity or part grammar ambiguities? Like, so your colon, your type annotation, how does it work with your ternary operator, things like that? Oh, I test the hell out of it. Now, is it is it a proof that there's no bugs? No, <laughs> absence of you know bugs is not proof of yeah. whatever that that question. Right, I test the <laughs> hell out of it. I write all <laughs> the funny corner cases and say, look, what happens if I do this? Uh, let's see what happens. And and why why do you prefer handle parsers? Because they're way the hell simpler and easier to manipulate, and they're fast. It's easy. Th this parser is small and fast and easy to manipulate. And mm -hmm. I can show you how it works. It's in one file. It's slowly created up to about 1,200 lines. I should move a bunch of utilities out, and then it would shrink back down to something, a couple hundred lines. Yeah, I, I also love them because it's much easier to get really good error messages. And it seems like parsers over time end up doing, doing more error recovery logic that's, let's yeah. say, not highly principled and not, mechan not, yeah. not mathematical. Yeah. It's right. <laughs> Huge amounts of special cases to cover the common things people run into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I parser recovery is a thing that I, I, I throw a bunch of test cases that I know are, I want them to recover a certain way typically. Type errors, I have a whole different game going on where because of my lattice game, I can hold on to ambiguous and type errored things at high resolution sort of indefinitely throughout. And so later when it comes time to actually decide, I have an error I'm going to report, I have a lot of more information that you might expect. Like, like standard Henley Milner says, 
oh, you're doing a recursive self unification. I die now. Throw an exception. Boom, dead. Right. And now I had, okay, you got something screwed exactly. up here. The problem is now you have to like reverse engineer the constraint solver to understand what, what went wrong. <laughs> well, but that's what I did. I mean, you show me in terms of how you report it. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the, the yeah. end user of the language. So, so, right. so now comes the reporting game on these things for which I have yeah, made some progress. We could argue I, there's certainly room for more, but like I can gather up all the places where constraints, in fact, I'm doing much of that. Not all of it, but much of it, gathering constraints where places where constraints were made. Then line them out. That's not happening right now, but I have that information and I can get it easily. So, so something will happen there a little more. Ooh, let, let me bug you about a completely different thing. So okay, uh, there's, there's more comments coming out in the in the uh, chat too. Uh, uh, well, okay. One quick one. So so you and I have both spent way too much time working on graph based compiler errors. Yes. So this this is apparently this a flaw. Used to be our, up until this morning, but fine, yeah. yeah. Well, so this is the flaw of our upbringing, apparently. But um, but this whole new world of accelerators is moving to dense compute. And you mentioned bit vectors in passing in the context of your lattice, your lattice yeah. work, right? But, yeah. but aren't bit vectors like back again? Like, doesn't it make sense to reevaluate all that work that we moved beyond when like the rise of SSA and all these other graph-based algorithms came out? Not, not reevaluate it in that way. SSA gives me uh, an incremental uh, uh, sort of linear time guarantee. It removes the big O notation that the classical guys, the bit vectors to make one of the big O, the N squared would be really cheap, but it was N squared. Um, SSA takes that away. So I don't want to lose that. I'm bringing back in a linear component to resolve my overloads. And it's linear in the size of the overload. So that's what's going on with the bit vector. Well, I guess I'm, I'm trying to, to poke your uh, compiler implementer. Yeah, right. Bit. And yeah. so like, you know, when you're doing data flow analysis and, and compiler optimizations and stuff like this, like right. at what point does the common size of a method or a compilation boundary be so small that the, the algorithmic benefit of SSA no longer this wins. Is your, this, is your, this is your LLVM thinking getting in your way. The, the, the convert from Java bytecodes to SSA happens in bytecode parsing and is in linear time and is super cheap and fast. This is like microseconds or less per bytecode, nanos per bytecode, it's stupid fast. You go to SSA form directly from your intermediate representation in case of bytecodes, it, it almost zero cost. I'm not, about, wait, 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 wait. I'm not talking about the cost of building SSA. I'm talking about the cost of data flow algorithms, like like register allocation or you know. No, okay. Register allocation is not a data flow algorithm. You need liveness analysis, which is the 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 as soon as I go to SSA form, I do all the bytecode analysis on the SSA form. And that's linear in the count of bytecodes. That's SSA being fast and efficient for doing analysis. Go to the register allocator. That's what your register allocator does for whatever cost. So it's linear to go produce instructions and it's linear to go do all your analysis and it's linear to do your code motion and your dead collation, your constants on your blah, 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 blah. Okay, now register allocation. You got a linear scan or you get a graph coloring. Your linear scan, you're linear. You got a graph coloring, you're in square. It can't be dodged. It has nothing to do with data flow. I switch formats There's to do the graph coloring. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> so yeah, the graph coloring in hotspot goes to a bit vector. Goes to several flips formats repeatedly because that's the most efficient algorithm. It goes from a triangulated list of things, it goes to a bit vectors and goes back and forth every other flip flop, taking some number of passes to get you done. Makes a really great allocation at the fastest graph coloring allocator I've ever seen, which is still much slower than a linear scan, but it gets you a better allocation. Um, do you want to go to some other questions? <laughs> yep. So um, there's two that I see. So let's take the one on IRs. Um, so Matt asks, does SSA offer the right balance for today's, uh, for today, or are there more practical gains from using more advanced, advanced IRs like SSI? Yeah. So, so I don't know what SSI is over SSA, but my experience says that what I call SSA is really the sea of nodes, which gives me all the other properties. Like, I, I don't know what more advanced or what more practical over the C of nodes IR is. It's linear time over the whole program. It's constant to get every use in depth. Um, and it has all the information you want sort of directly available as a localized piece of thing and supports all kinds of other cool optimizations at you know, essentially no cost. It, it's a really cool IR. Now, is it SSI versus SSA? I don't know. So if, if I recall, SSI is when you have like a tau node or something at merge points. And so you're computing- What's the a tau point? node versus a phi node? So I was going to answer that. <laughs> so what, what a town node, so is, so I guess, Matt, is that, am, I, am I remembering this right? It's been Matt, throw a link out. It's Matt, Matt, throw a link. Uh, it says um, static single information is the uh, expansion of the acronym, but that's all I 
Uh, and, uh, okay, so, so okay, I get the backwards one for free, Matt, too. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, so the <laughs> so okay, what, fine. I'm willing to go there. Yeah. So what SSI gives you is it gives you the um, you know at, if you define two values on your then and your else, you can refer to a single node value even if it's not used yet, right? And so if you have in SSA, you'd get a fee node at, at the merge point if it gets used below you. What SSI does is it gives you it defines that thing instead of a fee node, it defines it as a tau node. Again, this is my like 15, 20 year old memory of some okay. ancient research paper, right? Right. Um, so and so my, my answer to that is, uh, at least in the LVM case, we tried similar things and it ends up being a really bad idea. The reason for that is that um, you, get an, you get this blow up of tau nodes you have to create and maintain in the IR. It makes it more difficult to transform the IR, but more often than not, you don't actually need it. <laughs> and so what we found on, on balance is that if you actually want to go do, for example, a load promotion, you want to see if there's two stores, then what's be it's better on average for the compiler engineering perspective to actually just do the work on the, the few uses that you care about instead of proactively producing this IR in case it's useful. The one case that LVM used something similar to that is uh, called loop closed SSA form. And so in loop closed SSA form, that's making sure on all your latch blocks exiting out of a loop that you have you have uh, specific values available because you want to enable like loop rotation, like this whole class of loop transformations and ha maintaining it just for loop exits uh, on balance. Oh. So, so let me let me claim that there's a confusion here on what SSA means, at least to me. Static single assignment means statically single assigned once. All these things of like, like uh, I have a fee only if it's used, or I have latch exit blocks on loops that guarantee to have fees or not. That just says I have more fees or less fees, or I have them, or I don't need them, or I do, or whatever. That's independent as far as I'm concerned. I totally throw in, I start by building SSA forms stupid and fast. I get a lot of extra fees. They disappear in the people optimizer. When it comes to loop transforms, I want to rotate loops. I throw them back in so that I can rotate the loop. Um, that's sort of independently, I wouldn't call it a different format. I just, that's still SSA. So just to see if nodes do this, yes. It has fees for merging points that are used until they're not used and they go away. If I want to do this loop promotion thing to get rid of loads on, or store promotion, get rid of loads on different arms or whatever, I do that as a local people transform, not as a global thing. The loop rotation, totally do what just Chris said. I look at all the exits, I build up all the right fees so I can rotate, and then I rotate and go to town with other loop things. Da -da 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 -da. So as far as I'm concerned, I have a single graph IR format. It's also an SSA form. It also supports a lot of other things. Um, that's what I'm using for AA as well. There's a knowable guy having a knowable question. Mm -hmm. um, so I would claim that I've got knowable figured out in that I have it in my lattice in the good way that the, the it, it, it it behaves as you can use it as if you want to use like an option type, except that the, the guarantee will be that you don't take up any storage for the option type. And also the not present value is known to be a hardware zero because the hardware all has good efficient versions for that and it has other hardware accelerations for null checking that you can do with that. Um, as it performant, I say it's more performant than doing an option type, not you, less, like, like a lot you, more. Your option type stack? Can you have some like T question, question? As soon as you want to have stacked things, it's going to be, I'm expecting you to have a, a, an object as a second layer in. So this is a one layer of an option type. So nil is just a one layer option type. It's a not available. It's, a, it's also freely an int or a float as yeah, a yeah. nil value as well. Uh, That's right, the lattice well, doing things. When you get to playing with the runtime version, you might want to look at what Swift does for this. Uh, it has Sorry, a, a, look at what? It, what, the way that Swift runtime implements this has a fairly cool thing where it does bit stealing out of pointers and uh, yeah. out, of, out of enums and out of arbitrary types yeah. to represent that bit. And so it just gives you a yeah. very dense memory format. Yeah, I didn't know Swift did it, but I'm well aware of that technique. Yeah, um, yeah. it's cool because when you have options that stack up, it composes correctly. And so it's not a special case for the root, the root case. OK, that's well, interesting. So there's a cost model there that's interesting. So I think we're coming towards the end of our slot. So I think, you know, now parting thoughts, last words, um, anything you want to leave our audience with? <laughs> I see a lot of questions yet not answered. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think the parting thought is I, I would like to encourage people to actually build programming languages. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. 
I mean, I think um, that that's really the key thing is that I think that there's too much negative sentiment about playing with programming languages and building things. And I really believe you only learn something. I mean, the, the, the best and deepest way to learn something is by doing it. And so, you know, there's so much negative sentiment about pooping programming language development and research and type systems and things like this. And, um, you know, there's a lot of programming languages out there, but mostly they're remixes of existing things. And that's okay. Like remix a lot of what you like about other things and then pick a few different exciting things that you want to prove or ex experiment with and you can do a lot of cool stuff and building things Go do awesome. as an understanding of why the languages are how they are that's a that's a big one yeah so so i think it, it is i will just add that it's it's important also to have good building blocks so you don't have to always build your languages from scratch i think one of the the, the nice things about java when it came out was that the bytecode gave a, a foundation on which to build and people experimented a lot on, on, on top of the, that, that foundation. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think you know, maybe LLVM maybe now is used as another foundation, maybe at right. a higher, at a different level. And, you know, we, one of the things we should provide is, is like, you know, building blocks that people can play with because doing it all from scratch is a hell of a lot of a big ask. Yeah, well, so, but I mean, I, I like just to play the same card on the code gen side, right? There are a lot of really high quality code generators out there, but building your own, even if you have no, no intent to making a production quality, will like surely teach you a ton of really interesting algorithms. And again, that's it's hugely different implementing your own, you know, linear scan is a solved problem, sure, fine, but implement it yourself. Like you get into a bunch of really interesting problems that it's, there's a lot of nuance in one implementation versus the other. I've, I've worked with people using LLVM in, in Julia and, uh, and as a code generator and also for Java. And uh, there's some issues with LLVM for sort of dynamic code generation and a lot of effort to, to make it work well. And it's still not, it's still not the same kind of experience you would get if you had a, a, a JIT, but then find a high quality portable JIT technology. And that one, I don't know that's out there. That would be, I wish that was out there. Well, see, see this is the problem with LVM. I mean, one, one of the many problems with LVM is that, um, so did you know that LVM originally was started as a Java thing? <laughs> and, and it was about three months in that it got diversion to a C thing. <laughs> but um, uh, there's a parallel universe in which that, that didn't happen. But, um, but uh, LVM is, is useful for certain things, but it's not perfect by any, by any stretch, right? And so it's GC support is, it's there, but it's kind of dubious and it's not yeah, super right. awesome. It, it's right, getting right. support is difficult to to make do well and fast. Like I've, I've talked to guys doing the Azul LLVM back in, yeah, yeah. and they do a lot of effort to bring in uh, performance counters to make it generate good code. It's still ten times slower than C2, and I would say it's. It, and they're actually saying it's it's pretty close to C2, but that pretty close is a hard hard yeah, thing to say. That's yeah, pretty close to something I just got when I downloaded the thing already, uh, except that I, it's. I would be surprised if it's anywhere near C2. <laughs> and same thing, like people- No, no, it's so quality. Compile time's 10 times slower. Yeah. And that's the hard trade-off. The Julia guys get much worse quality because they don't have the performance counters built in. And yeah. they also get the 10X slowdown over like, you know, some other uh, custom made JIT there. So well, you know, well, they're in a harder spot for any sort of dynamic JITing experience. Well, so- We have, have to depend on standards. Stuff like that. We have to, you know, before the next talk, we have to sweep the Zoom room, remove the empty cans, and, you know, get it ready. So You need to have a shepherd's crook come out and drag people off, pull them off stage. Um, so I want to thank Chris and Cliff for the discussion. Hey, is there a place and, we can go to answer more questions for people? Uh, sadly, not organized. Um, yeah, I don't have anything, but... Um, Thanks a lot. Virtual or real claps. And Please thanks. Call PCS, yes, we could. All right, and Coffee Compiler Club. We can carry on this conversation next week. I don't know. And we'll uh, be back in a few minutes with um, talk, a quite different talk by.